Good morning, everyone. The recording has started. Welcome to today's session on the New Testament survey. Today, we're going to study on the second book of the New Testament, that is the Gospel to Mark. Even before we could start with our session, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Can I request Brother Isaac to lead us in prayer, please? Uh, Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for bringing us together to attend this class in New Testament survey. We want to praise you, we adore you, we magnify your name. We ask that what we are taking in or what we are about to learn will grow up in, in us, will become a seed that will multiply. Father God, take seat in our heart. We want to bless you for the life of our lecturers, our pastors who are impacting knowledge in us. I want to thank you for the life of all of us who are attending class, for our families and for our relatives. We want to thank you for this opportunity giving us to all people's college. We thank you for everything that you are doing for us and everything that you have to do for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Isaac. Yes. So I hope everyone would have gone through the notes of uh, the Gospel of Mark. Have you all? Did you take some time to go through the notes? Because there's a lot of information in the notes that we would not be able to cover it in our last time. But then I request, as we study, let it benefit us. Let's take this time to go through the book of, uh, I mean, the Gospel of Mark. Well, the Gospel of Mark was the first accounts of the life of Jesus. And uh, earliest historians tradition links this book to the Christian scribe named Mark or John Mark. His name means polite or a big hammer. He was a co-worker with Paul and also very close partner with Peter. In fact, some scholars say, uh, call it uh, the gospel of Mark, they call it as Peter's gospel. And in fact, an ancient church historian named Papias, he recalls that Mark had collected all of these eyewitness accounts and the memories of Peter, and then he shaped them into an account. But Mark didn't just randomly uh, throw all the pieces together, but then he has carefully designed the story of Jesus. And in the first line of the book of Mark, Mixus claim about Jesus says, it's the beginning of good news. For Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And interestingly, this is the only time where Mark is going to tell us a story that what he thinks. And then later for the rest of the book, it's going to inspire us by simply putting uh, Jesus' action and his words in front of us and showing us that how other people reacted to Jesus, to his teaching, to his word, a different kind of reactions. Even when we studied the Gospel of Matthew, we saw not everyone who followed Jesus accepted the teaching, but then each one followed for their own personal reason. But then now Mark has designed this gospel, saying the story of Jesus in a drama format. We can put it across like three acts. In the very first act, we see one set in Galilee. And in the second, we see uh, Jesus on the way from one place to the other. And in the third, we see that Jesus is in Jerusalem. And each of these acts focuses on a repeated theme. For example, in Act 1, we see that every, everybody was blown away by Jesus and they were wondering, who is this Jesus? And in Act 2, we see that it's his own disciples now. And they are struggling to understand 
what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. Who is this man? They're trying to understand him, but then at the same time, they're very scared to ask any question. But then they're allowing the time, you know, so that they can understand exactly. Even though the words that Jesus was speaking may be far away from their understanding. But then they were scared, yes, to ask Jesus. Second, they thought that they will understand in time. Not everything I'll be able to understand now, but in time, I will understand. They gave themselves some time. And also, Jesus knowing that, Jesus also knows about his disciples that they're not able to understand everything. But then he gives them the time to understand. Same like the disciples, even we, maybe today, not everything that we read, we study, that we share in the class, we're able to understand. But then we allow ourselves to go through it so that in time, we will receive the understanding of his word, of the spirit who's dwelling in us. And here we see the act three. We see the surprising paradox of how Jesus becomes a messianic king. Okay, so keeping these background in our mind, we need to study the gospel of Mark so that we can understand it better. As this class is only the survey, we will only be studying about the author, the background, and certain important incidents or the events from the Gospel of Mark. But then I would encourage you, we meet, uh, we meet only two days in a week, that is Monday and Tuesday for about an hour. I request each one to please go through the gospel of Matthew and Mark for us to understand better. Because uh, in the class, we would have gone through the background. We have gone through certain historical incidents that happened. So keeping all this in mind, when we read these gospel, the revelation would be much greater and better. So one suggestion could be, yes, we can uh, read the Bible through. The other way that we could do is use the audio Bible. Use the audio Bible two, three times. When you play it, you can understand each chapter by chapter and use different colors to highlight it and study and have a deeper relationship with God by understanding His Word. Any questions so far? if I could move ahead or you would like to add on anything. Class is very quiet. Yes, ma'am, you can go ahead. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> when we talk about the author, what do you know about Mark or John Mark? Anything that you know about this author of the Gospel of Mark? Please feel free to share anything. What is? Uh, what do you know about the author? It can be anything. Okay, from next class onwards, I would request you all, because all the answers are in our notes and much deeper. I request you all, please go through the notes, okay? Well, I'll just give you, share a few background, few background of the author of the book of Mark. Book of Mark. The author was John Mark, and we know his name. What does his name mean? Can anyone say? I just repeated a few minutes back. I just shared it a few minutes back. Polite or being a uh, big hammer? Yes, yes. His name means polite or big hammer. Well, his name, the full name of Mark was John Mark. How do we know? Can I request one of his turn to Acts chapter 12, verse 12? Acts 
Acts 12, verse 12, please. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. Yes, thank you. See, here in Acts 12, 12, we see that his full name has been mentioned. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So this is a combination. John Mark is a combination of Greek and Latin or a Roman name. So it may suggest that his father was a Roman and his mother was a Greek, in which case uh, he was most likely a Roman citizen. So here we see that is the details of his mother is given in Acts 12, 12. We see that his mother name was Mary. A little bit about his family, we see that. So uh, little is known about her except her name. And she had a home that was large enough for a gathering of a church. Uh, uh, they met there uh, week after week or very often. And uh, the early Christian community also say that uh, the upper room, maybe uh, it was about their house. And also uh, in Acts 12, 12, when we read, it also says that apparently she was a person of wealth. So there is no mention about his father here. So the scholars suggest that maybe the father was not a a Christian or a Jew, but then um, and um, he was no longer in the home. Possibly, maybe he was dead. So the emphasis was seen to be uh, given in the relationship uh, between uh, uh, the other relationship we see here with John Mark is Barnabas, who was his uncle or a cousin. The, there's a relationship between John Mark and Barnabas, when we read the book of Colossians, we see that in chapter 4, 10, that, uh, you know, uh, he was the cousin, he was a relative to John Mark. And the early life of Mark was a um, little bit uh, is known about his childhood, but it is most likely that he was used being around very important figure in the early church. Um, one reason could be because they had this uh, Christian gathering at home. So maybe that was one of the reason. And he was most likely uh, very close to the ministry of Jesus uh, because his mother was in faith and uh, and she walked very closely with Jesus so that, you know, she impacted a son. So some historians suggest that this home, where uh, John Mark lived was the ministry center for Jesus. They often met there. And they also suggest that, as I said, the upper room uh, was the place where Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Last Supper and uh, uh, Last Supper and where also uh, after the ascension of Jesus, where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened, the day of Pentecost, uh, some scholars say maybe it was the upper room where, it, uh, where John Mark lived in their house, the upper room. So we are not sure, just the scholars say about, you know, the situation and the openness, the meeting that they had, maybe it was in his place. And uh, he is not named in the gospel that bears his name. But most scholars feel that it is most likely that uh, the unnamed man in the book is Mark. Is Mark because there's certain culture that they used to follow before the uh, authors uh, who write the book. It was a custom for the authors to leave off their name out of the book when they are writing. So that would have been one of the reasons why John Mark has not mentioned his name. And uh, the main theme when we study the book, the main theme of this book is Christ, the tireless servant of God and Christ the tireless servant of God and man. So the whole book is portraying Jesus as a servant of God and man. So keeping this in mind, we need to study further. Some of the experience that John Mark had, we can see through the book of Acts when we read. So in Acts 12, 25, can I request one of us turn to Acts chapter 12, verse 25? Another person, please turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 
four to five. I'll just type few scriptures. X twelve thirty five, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Thank you. The next person read Acts 13, 4 to 5. And another person take up Acts 13, 13. 4 to 5. The two of them sent on their way by, by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Yes, thank you. So in the first verse, Acts 12, 25, we see that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem and when they fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So we see that he returned to Antioch from Jerusalem with Barnabas and Paul after they presented the church with a relief offering. And in the second verse, which is uh, uh, Acts 13, 4 to 5, we see that John Mark accompanied Barnabas and Paul on the first missionary journey to serve as their assistant. So what happened? Do anyone remember what happened to John Mark after this? The first missionary journey. Any incidents that you're able to recollect? After the first missionary journey, there are certain incidents that happened. It was not very easy for John Mark. Maybe he was not very mature enough or grown in faith, or it was too tiring for him. This many reasons, or he was homesick. There are many reasons that he could not uh, continue the journey with Paul and Barnabas. So he leaves in the middle of the way and returns back home. And this upsets Paul. This upsets Paul. We see that in Acts 15, 37 to 39, we see that John Mark leaves the team and he goes back home to Jerusalem early on the journey. And uh, this was interpreted by Paul. Paul feels like he's taking it very serious, very negative. What is this young guy? He could have continued with us, but then he left in the middle. So I don't want... Uh, <clears throat> You know, he, he's not having any kind of good report on John Mark. And um, so even in future, when he comes back and when Barnabas say, can I call John Mark along with us for the ministry? Well, Paul rejects it. Paul says no. He, he Last time he left us in between, he had homesick. And it, it's difficult for us when we go out on ministry to have someone not cooperating or being helpful to us in the journey. So I don't want to take him with the past experience. But then the, uh, there would be a sharp, a sharp conflict between me, just a disagreement between John Mark and Barnabas. So uh, when they go in the next missionary journey, um, Paul drops John Mark. But Barnabas encourages to take him in the ministry. But then because Paul is disagreeing, so this is what they do. Barnabas and Mark pair up together and they go to share the word in different place. <clears throat> and Paul will join Silas and they will travel together. But later what happens, we will study. So some of the reason, yes, as I said, and uh, Barnabas being his uncle, he is a man of encourager. Barnabas was a man of encourager. Yes, despite what John Mark did, Barnabas give, gives him a second chance. We see that in Acts 15, Barnabas gives him a second chance and he, uh, you know, uh, he, he helps John Mark to overcome his problem. I think by then, uh, you know, the Lord would have prepared John Mark in time and then John Mark goes journeys with Barnabas. 
And uh, we also see in Philemon 24 and in 2 Timothy 4, 11, later, after many years, uh, later when Paul was in prison, we see that, uh, you know, John Mark has come back to help and assist Paul. And here we see in Philemon 24 or in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Can I request one of us turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11? Second Timothy chapter four verse eleven. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very helpful to me for the ministry. Yes, thank you. So Paul writes here. He acknowledges that John Mark is profitable in the ministry. Though Paul rejected him before, but later as he saw and he witnessed how faithfully John Mark started to serve in the ministry along with Barnabas, he heard the report of him. And then he also experienced him when he met. And here he writes, get Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me for the ministry. You see, sometimes even we would have faced some situation, ups and downs, some failures in our ministry, people may give up. But then the Lord who's in you, the Lord who's called you is faithful enough to work in and through you. So all of us have certain weaknesses in us, just like John Mark. We may not be bold enough. We may not have certain skills in us that is required in the ministry at the time when we have been serving alongside with some good leaders. But then do give up. Continue. Continue because the Lord is working in and through you. People may give up. Like a leader like Paul who gave up on Mark at certain season. Now the same leader is looking up looking at Mark and acknowledging acknowledging him that he's profitable in the ministry. God can turn things around for us. God can turn things around for us. And it is, uh, perhaps it is a worthy note to receive from a man of God like Paul. And what happened? The man who was rejected once and he has become the writer of a gospel of the servant. This gospel of Mark is also known as the gospel of servant. Matthew, what was the gospel of Matthew was known as? Do anyone remember from last class? Gospel of Matthew was also known as gospel of? Okay, Gospel of Matthew was also known as Gospel to Jews. Okay, this is known as Gospel to Romans. But at the same time, Gospel of Matthew, what was focused on that throughout the kingdom? Gospel of King, Kingdom. And here we see Gospel of the Servant. Gospel of the Servant in the book of Mark. So, what was the tradition in those days when Mark was writing? What was the tradition? Many believe that because of the unique use of his mother's home, Mark had a bit of spiritual uh, father or son relationship with Peter. Because Peter being the leader was very effective. And how do we know that? We read that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. And I request one of us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. First Peter chapter 5, verse 13 says, She who is in Babylon, led together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. I request everyone to have your Bibles handy in the class so that when we requ uh, when I request, please take and you know, read out loud. It helps us to be interactive in the class. Here we see that. 
Peter greeting John Mark's mother. She was in Babylon elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Look at the relationship between Peter and John Mark, a spiritual father-son relationship, that which we also see between Paul and Timothy. So here we also see that uh, he is believed to have acted like uh, uh, Paul's, uh, sorry, Peter's interpreter when he preached in Rome. So whatever is contained in the Gospel of Mark came from the relationship or the association with Peter. So Mark was writing or uh, uh, whatever Peter was sharing, you know, Mark started writing it. And we also see the early church father, Irenaeus, suggested that Mark's gospel was a reflection of more of Peter's preaching because of the relationship, because of the time that he spent together with Peter. And it is also believed that after his work with Peter at Rome, he went to Alexandria, Egypt, and helped establish the church there. While in the work there, he was severely persecuted. Now, the Romans was ruling. The Romans were ruling the place and, you know, there were a lot of persecution to the Christians. They, um, John Mark was severely persecuted and tortured. Imagine, the guy who ran away and now is undergoing the persecution and torture under the reign of this Roman government. But what we see here is, we see that he's not, uh, we don't see that he's wavering anymore. We see that the determination is very much strong in him. We see that the man who ran away, who was scared, ran away with fear, who could not keep up uh, with the pressure, over the situation that uh, you know the Christian leaders would go through, he ran away once, but now God has made him so courageous, so strong that he is able to undergo any kind of persecution and torture for the faith's sake, the gospel's sake. And how did all this happen? All this happened because there was someone who believed in him and encouraged him. Though he failed, but still Barnabas encouraged him. And we see that the gospel spread through Mark. You know, some of the traditions say that John Mark was martyred under the reign of Nero government. So those days, uh, the persecution and crucifixion was very common very common and also some of the scholars says that John Mark was tied behind the horseback and he was dragged through the city may not be once or twice but many times and some of them say that was uh, one of the last time and the cause of his death was that So under the Roman government is when, you know, we study about the crucifixion that, uh, you know, the Romans had this practice of uh, uh, crucifixion was practiced as a method of torture and to execute, you know, uh, all the people who were against them. So under the Roman citizen way, even Jesus was crucified. And we see that in our notes, we have given a detailed information on crucifixion, like how they crucified Jesus and what happened and how did they put a title on, uh, on the cross of Jesus, not only on the cross of Jesus, it can be any, any thieves, anyone who was against the Roman government, they used to crucify them and put up a title there. And for Jesus, they put up a title saying that I am R I, uh, which has a Latin phrase, Jesus of Nazareth, Rex Eudorium, which means Jesus of Nazareth, King of Jews. And this was the notice put up by Pontius Pilate, nailed over the cross of Jesus. And now many were reading that inscription. 
And this was also translated in three languages because that was commonly spoken. It was translated in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And here we see the chief priest comes and uh, tells the pilot, like, he is not the king of the Jews. But then the pilot says, that's what he said. So what I have written, I have written. I request you to please go through what happened, uh, how cruel act, how uh, how Christians were killed during the reign of Nero under the Roman government. I request you to please read that in the notes so that we have a clear idea. And John Mark also died and he was martyred under the leadership of Nero. So now with this, we will we will come to a place where when was this book? of Mark written. As in most of the books, the Bible were considered as a debate. They agreed or there was some kind of disagreement when, what time, when, which season did they write each one. But here in the Gospel of Mark, it's believed that many scholars come in an agreement that it was the first gospel that was written. And in an early date, uh, as per our notes, it says 57 to 59 AD, and some says 60 uh, to about uh, 60, uh, 61 to 68 AD. As I said, the dates may vary, but then the book was written. This gospel was written, and it was one of the earliest gospel to, for which even Matthew and Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew, Luke referred to. Matthew and Luke refer to Mark's gospel and they wrote this. So most scholars believe that uh, it was written in Rome. And four years in the life of Jesus from the ministry of John the Baptist to the ascension of Jesus has been covered in the 16 chapters of Mark. And to whom was this book addressed to? Whom was, to whom was uh, the Gospel of Mark addressed to? Well, it was addressed to the Gentiles, to the Romans who was living there. His desire was to show the Romans that Jesus was God's servant and acting under the authority of the Lord God. And he also gives us an immediate and full obedience to all his commands. And there are several evidence and throughout the book when we read, we come across several evidence of Jesus obeying his father. We see that uh, at the very start of uh, Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, 2 to 3, we see that it was written to Gentiles. And we find that one uh, actual quotation from the Old Testament, and it was regarding the John the Baptist and not about Jesus. And this was a contrast between the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. Because in the book of Matthew, we see that 60 Old Testament quotations were there. But then in the book of Matthew, not much, not much, not maybe one or two has been quoted. But then Mark omits much of his preaching style uh, of Jesus. But then he actually quotes uh, the, uh, the actions of Jesus. He records the action of Jesus. One of the reasons, because he is writing to the uh, set of the Roman people or to the Gentiles, they do want to have any kind of preaching. They don't want to hear any kind of preaching. But then they are much interested, the Romans are much interested in the practice and the action. So accordingly, as he writing to this set of group, accordingly he takes the action of Jesus and he writes it down. Because the Romans were much inclined and they were much uh, interested in the practices and not in the preaching of an individual. Um, I think among the all four Gospels, it was Mark was the only one who gives us a translation of an Aramic word that Jews would have often used. When we turn to Mark chapter 4, 
verse 41. Can I request anyone to turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 41? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Mark chapter 4, verse 41. Yes, Pastor. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Maybe I've got the scripture not right. Okay. There's also another place where um, Mark quotes about a, a synagogue leader's daughter who was dead. Who, who, they reported that she was dead. And here he goes into their house. He, he helds her hand and he says, Talitha Kumi. And then that is an uh, Aramic word, and it, it translated, okay, which is translated uh, saying that little girl, I say to you, rise. So he was the one who used a few of the Aramic words for the common language which was spoken then. And we also see Mark uh, often gives a Latin version of certain normal Greek words which suggest a Roman orientation. Well, the term that Mark used. Uh, for example, uh, throughout this book, when we see for the basket, maybe a different word for the tax, a centurion, and all these were Latinized version of these words to make this um, gospel of Mark familiar to a certain set of people. And we also see that Mark seems to feel the need to give a geographical description of the Mount of Olives. And uh, he also uh, shares that Jordan was a river for which Jews don't need an explanation of all that because they know what Mount, Mount Olive means and what Jordan means. But then because he's writing to the set of different people, so he had to explain it. And also Mark omits many uh, references to Jewish law, which would not impress the Romans. So accordingly, as he's writing this gospel to the Gentiles, Romans, so he is omitting certain things that may not please them. But then at the end of the day, his intention is to share the gospel of Jesus to the unreached crowd. So what was the purpose of writing this book? Anyone in the class? Well, we see when we read this book, we see the basic purpose to have been to win the uh, Christian faith by presenting Jesus of Nazareth as the perfect and a faithful servant of the Lord. And he immediately acknowledges as a son of God in Mark chapter 1 verse 1 and then shows him to be the suffering servant and the willing sacrifice for the sins of the this is how we portrays Jesus in the gospel. And what is that makes the gospel of Mark as the gospel of saint or the book of servant? There are certain words that he mentions in this gospel which makes which makes the scholars to call this book as a book of a servant. One, few points I just list out. The first indication of the servanthood is the absence of genealogy, birth record, or the adoration of the wise men, pre-existence in glory and early life. It's not that Mark did not make a, uh, he was not aware of all these incidents in the life of Jesus or the early life of Jesus, but then he intentionally didn't mention well, why? One of the reasons was a servant's genealogy is of no importance to the Roman mind. There is no real value to a servant or a slave until they can start to work. So Mark jumps right into the work of Jesus, into the action of Jesus, which the Romans may be interested in. And the second point we see that the focus on the work of serving rather than uh, you know, uh, talking about serving. So there is no Sermon on the Mount has been recorded in the book of Mark, no lengthy 
uh, preaching or uh, no lengthy preaching, but then yes, we see few of his uh, uh, miracles and parables have been noted in the book of Mark. And the third point, we see that Jesus performed miracles and he would often instruct those touched, uh, those who were healed, who were touched, uh, he instructed them not to tell anyone. Not to tell anyone. Why? The servants do not get a lot of credit for what they do in those days. Or it was not yet for the time. So one of the reasons which Jesus, after every miracle, for certain people, he said, do not tell anyone. But for certain people, he said, go show to the high priest. Another point we see here is Jesus' ministry at times left him no time to eat. Not only to Jesus, even to his disciples. So we see in Mark chapter 3 verse 20. Mark 3 verse 20. Then the multitude came together again. So they could not so much as eat bread. They were so busy, they were so the multitude, there were many people who were attend to. So Jesus gave the priority to serve people than to pay attention to his own need. So yes, Jesus was the son of God at the same time. He was man. He was God, he was man. So he has emotions, he has sense, he would be hungry, he would be tired. That's what the word says. He was tired. He walked very far up. He was tired. So he went and sat when he was crossing the Samaria near the well of Jacob. And now we see he's so tired. Like, you know, ministering to people, he had no time to eat. Yes, maybe he was very hungry. Not only Jesus, along with Jesus, again, his, also, his disciples also were very hungry. So we see that Jesus laying aside his own needs to serve others. And there are some other things that are uh, uh, not there, but there is no reference to is the judgment of Christ and the king enthroned in glory. We don't see that. And Mark also does not mention what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, how the angel came and ministered to Jesus. We don't see that. But yes, we read that in the other Gospels, but not in the Gospel of Mark. So the book ends with Jesus still working in his followers. So the book of Mark is very important. We see the Christ in action through the lives of those who bear his name. We also see there's an army of believers who live to serve and touch and be felt, who served along with Jesus. And as we study this book, the Gospel of Mark, we should also know that some of the scholars feel that in the last chapter, the last chapter, Mark 16, Mark 16, the last chapter, can we turn to the last chapter, please? Yeah. 9 to 20. They feel the last chapter was only till verse 8. 19, 9 to 20, uh, uh, most particularly the verse 15. Sorry. 15 to 20 should not be included in the book of Mark. Why? The reason behind this has to do the fact that the oldest manuscript dating from 4th century do not contain these verses. It is rather interesting that uh, you know, there was a debate between the scholars that this verse was later added by some writers. Some feel that, you know, uh, Mark end, uh, ended this gospel abruptly. So later the writers filled in the gap from the other uh, by reading the other gospel and gave a sense of completion to this gospel. So some uh, some other scholars feel that uh, the manuscript that omits the verse reflect the fact that the last verse we dropped because they opposed a theological problem relating to the miraculous expression in Christ. So whatever the case may be, what is important for us to understand is that 
things mentioned by Christ in this commission are confirmed in other places in the New Testament. And therefore, we are safe for the purpose of doctrinal study and formation. These scriptures are very important because it is a great commission given by Jesus. We're not very sure did John Mark wrote or the other writers who have added this, but it makes sense for us that every gospel should end with a great commission. Every good news that has been shared should end with a great commission where the instruction of Jesus was given. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hand on the sick and they will recover. Well, after this, verse 19 and 20 says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So what a beautiful ending to show that Jesus has, Jesus has commanded each one to take up this gospel. Is good news and share it with others. Just like how Matthew Gospel confirms in Matthew 28, same way Mark also confirms in his uh, last chapter, carry this gospel. It is not something to be contended with, to just keep it to ourselves, but then it is a gospel to share. As you share, as we share, it will only be multiplied. this we end the gospel of mark so i leave it open to the class to share add on what was a learning just share each one share one point that we learned from the gospel of mark blessings Lamas, literally anyone, just share one point on what we studied, what we learned today from the Gospel of Mark. Um, Mark revealed Jesus to be a man of action. He was a representative of man of God and man. Yes. Anyone else? Brother Lubeka, Brother Isaac, Lyndon, Ruby, anyone? Um, Mark, we see, as we said, uh, uh, as Christ as a tireless servant of God and man, um, and also reveals Jesus, uh, emotions of Jesus. Um, you know, so as we discussed today, so sometimes um, his disappointment, uh, sometimes uh, his uh, Jesus appearing as wondered and sighed, um, affection, the emotion, different emotions of Jesus. Are also being carefully considered uh, while he was right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else would like to add on? Okay. Some of the points that we could recollect and recap, I'm just giving you. Mark presents Jesus as a suffering servant of God as one who came to serve and not to be served. He also, uh, he also came to be a sacrifice for us. So in part, to inspire us to do the same. We need to do and follow the same. We also see... Um, uh, yes, yes, Rosalind, please go ahead. Rosalind, 
Rosalind, I see your hand raised. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I I believe God will not give up on us. Uh, we learnt like you know, um, Mark uh, during his service he he turned back like we don't know the reason like for him like, but but uh, maybe he was um, uh, discouraged or disappointed or uh, he could not cope with the pressure. So maybe in our lives also, if sometimes if we give up on ourselves or in the ministry god will not give up on us yes. later we see that you know mark uh, really joined he came back he he was again so active that he wrote a gospel yes he was fruitful yes. in his ministry and he was helpful to paul as well yes yes thanks rosalind for sharing that very important thing yes so uh, from the life of mark yes as rosalind shared we need to learn to minister in that way uh, with the uh, same greatness and humility that they carried in themselves as taking the example from Jesus himself. He had a greatness of humility and the devotion, the sacrifice with which they served at the extent of their uh, physical uh, limitation. You know, they had to walk long miles, uh, not expecting any uh, royal treatment from people around. They were very simple people. They ate what was uh, given to them. Uh, even if there was no food, they uh, went ahead serving and, uh, you know, serving people. Nothing stopped them. So uh, looking at that, we need to be like that we need to be imitator of jesus and uh, you know as even paul says in his gospel that imitate me as i imitate christ because they went beyond the limitation they served they served god with all humility and with a lot of self-sacrifice and yes jesus was willing to lay down his life for the sheep so god is calling us to be selfless to ourselves today as we uh, set ourselves aside to serve god uh, in any area that god has uh, called us in so i request let let this be our prayer lord whichever area that we are in help us to serve you selflessly this should be our prayer Help us to have that heart to seek you despite our weakness, despite our limitations. I pray that, Lord, you enable us. You enable us. So just like how John Mark left and went, many reasons it can be. Maybe he was homesick, homesick or he was weak or he could not uh, keep up with the maturity uh, level of Barnabas or Paul, who was a great leader. Uh, you know, it can be many reasons or it could be uh, fearful or he didn't have enough of courage and confidence or he would have got scared with the persecution that each time these leaders went through. He was not ready to go through all that pressure at that time. Maybe it could be any of these reasons that John Mark ran away. But then he didn't give up. God didn't give up on him nor he. We see the fulfilling of God's purpose in his life. Unlike that, even in our life, nothing, one thing we need to remember, every time when I face challenges in my life, there's one word that comes to my mind is that God's work should not stop. God's work should not stop. Let not our weakness stop us from doing what God has called us to do. Let not the lack in skill stop us from what God has called us to do. Is there a way that we can improve, we can change? Will it take time for you to accomplish or to learn that skill? Yes, ask God, who is the giver of everything. God can give us the grace, the skill that is needed in the area that God has called us because God is faithful. The one who called you is faithful. So friends, as today, as we studied the gospel of Mark, we may have some of the weakness and challenges just like how Mark went through. But let us be like John Mark, who never gave up. Though he fell, but he never gave up. He trusted on God who called him, was faithful. Today, as we also trust God, let's trust God and ask God to fulfill that in our life. Okay, I will end the session with a quick prayer. Father God, I, I surrender and submit each one of us 
and myself in your hand. We pray that, Lord, you will help us not to give up in any area. But, Lord, the God who called us is faithful. And we trust in you, Lord, that you will help us to work in every weakness, in every area in our life, as we look up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, class. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry uh, we have exceeded the time. Thank you. Take a quick break and join the other class. God bless. Oh, there's no more class. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I thought there's a session after that. Okay, thank you. God bless. Have a great day. See you all next week with the next gospel. I request you all, please go through uh, the gospel of Matthew, gospel of Mark. Okay, one more thing. There's an assignment. I request you all to write an assignment, a short summary on gospel of Matthew and Mark. You can present it in a PPT or a Word format and upload it on the Google Classroom. I will create an assignment and send you all an email. Okay, thank you. God bless. See you all on Monday with the next course. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless.